Hi, this is Dan Olds hosting another call for a student cluster competition. And what we're doing today is asking the question, so you want to be an SCC advisor? And this is a call is designed to uh, help all of you budding student cluster competition competitors, uh, primarily advisors, give you some idea on how to put together your teams, how to get budget, how to get sponsors, all of that. And we're talking to some people that have some really deep experience in this. And I'm going to introduce them in turn. Let's start with you, Rebecca. It's Rebecca Hartman Baker. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, thanks, Dan. So my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I work at NERSC. Um, I spent two and a half years working at the Pawsey Supercomputing Center in Australia, where I had uh, two teams that I coached to the student cluster competitions in, at SC13 and SC14. Today I am on the student cluster competition uh, committee. Excellent. Uh, we also have out there Doug Smith. Doug? Um, my name is Doug Smith. I'm with the University of Colorado Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. Um, I have put together teams for eight of the past nine uh, SC competitions as well as international supercomputing competitions. You've been down the road with this competition. We also have uh, from Texas, uh, John Kaz and Carlos Rosales Fernandez. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm John Kaz. Um, I work at the Texas Advanced Computing Center at the University of Texas. I'm in charge of the H, part of the HPC applications group. I've been involved in coaching teams for the past five years. Um, not always the lead advisor, but always involved. It's including a team that's uh, done quite well, the first three-peat uh, in student cluster competition history. That's true. Had to get that in. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, so like, like John, I work in the uh, you know, Texas Advanced Computing Center at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also part of the High Performance Computing Group, and I've been involved with either uh, coaching directly or supporting uh, the team from the University of Texas at Austin for since 2010. Excellent. And last but not least, we have Stephen Harrell, who has, uh, who's from Purdue and has been quite involved in it, as he'll tell you, but he's also the um, chairperson for the competition this year. Steve? Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so in addition to what the, I, I work for Purdue University in, uh, in research computing, but in addition to um, me being the chair this year, um, I've taken teams to seven different competitions, including uh, the ISC as well as ASC. Um, so I, I have a little bit of experience in this. And you're heading up the effort this year in putting together the competition. Absolutely. First of all, just to throw a question out to you guys, what does the institution get from participating in this, and what do the students get out of it? Well, I think they get fame and fortune. That's what I <laughs> always tell people anyway. Sure. Um, so the, for, the, the lust for the, glory. Yeah. So, so from the Australian perspective, right, we were in the um, most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia, <laughs> and, and nobody had ever heard of us. So this was a really great way for us to go out there and say, hey, look, we are a supercomputing power, and we have all these awesome students who can do all this great stuff. Uh, what about um, you guys at TAC? What are your students getting out of it, and what's the institution get out of it? The students, for most of the students we've worked with, what they've appreciated, I think, most about this competition is hands-on experience with the hardware, mm -hmm. decisions in building the hardware, installing the system. Many of the students who've been in this competition with us have been in many uh, coding competitions, and they like this because it's quite different. Mm. And so what does TAC get out of it, or the University of Texas? Both. Well, for the University of Texas, maybe a little bit of the prestige at, comp at being at supercomputing and competing. At TAC, it's sort of a pipeline to some really good students who have worked here at TAC and done internships uh, over the years. Mm. So it, it's good for us. And for the students, of course, it's getting those internships and getting full-time jobs out of it, too. Yeah, but I would say that 
a lot of it is not so much getting internships. I mean, some of the students we get already have internships lined up even before they meet us, yeah. uh, right? But what they gain is something that they never get in school through a formal course. They learn real life, how does a cluster work, how do I maintain and operate a cluster, um, not a toy, but a real cluster. And that's something that is very valuable and gives them a very different perspective from when they will see in their in the classes. Uh, how about you, Doug? What do you think? Um, the students here at TU get, you know, they get exposure to uh, scientific computing and HPC. Uh, we try to, to pull students from not just the engineering college, but from uh, science disciplines, uh, you know, the, the bioengineering folks, the genomics. So they get exposure to the computing side. Um, my CS students get exposure to networking opportunities at an event like SC, potential career opportunities. We, we've had, just like Texas, we've had uh, a lot of our students go on to do, to create a career in HPC, specifically from this competition. And I know you've seen some of the same things at Purdue, right, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, um, our students get uh, a lot out of it just having the hands-on experience. And, I, you know, when I think of the competition, I don't think of it in necessarily a, a depth of experience, but in a breadth of experience. They're going to experience a lot of things at the competition that they, they haven't experienced before, including, you know, the hands-on with the hardware, but also, you know, the, the, the HPC community as a whole. So I think, you know, that that's pretty important. The other thing that um, that the that, that Purdue gets out of it is um, just giving these students experience. We have a a, a lot of programs that that, that point to um, exper experiential learning, and um, our um, my kind of small group at Purdue Research Computing, um, we actually hire quite a few of our students, and, and we have uh, I think we've hired at least five or six students that have gone through uh, the programs to. Um, you know, we're a little bit like posy. No one really wants to live in Indiana. You just kind of happen to. Um, so um, finding students and convincing them to, to stay here is important to uh, keeping our HPC center healthy. But like they say, Indiana is the thinking man's Iowa. That's right. It sure is. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about what comes first. Do you find a team first or do you find a sponsor first? or get administration buy-in? So I think first you really have to get administration buy-in. So what I did was I knew I wanted to have a team, so I took my boss uh, over to the student cluster competition at SC12, and then he found out for himself how awesome it was. And then he said, gee, we should have a team. And I was like, yeah, I know, we should. So uh, that, I think that's the first step. So not a huge sales job in your case. No, no, not a huge sales job. What about you other guys? Our first team actually came to us yep. and asked us to help them compete. Although, I agree with Rebecca. I mean, before you can go very far, you really need to get an administration buy-in mm. because you'd hate to form a team and then find out you have no support. That makes sense. Uh, what about you, Doug? You put uh, together, what, nine or ten teams. How did it start back in the early days? <laughs> um, in the early days, uh, in the early days, wow, I sound old. Uh, in 2006, I came back from SC, and I sort of just grassroots put out a bunch of advertisements uh, to the student body to see if there was interest. And there turned out to be a significant amount of interest. Uh, and then we, we went to sponsors, and then we went to administration. Uh, the administration's always been very supportive of us. The first uh, four or five years, we were completely self-funded. So mm -hmm. we went out and we sought uh, sponsorship, both financially and from hardware and software vendors. And so we were, it looked very nice to my administration because we were very uh, low cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, that was kind of a key driver for us. Now we've been able to show... Uh, value to the university in our students either returning to go to grad school or getting jobs immediately after graduation and not not jobs where they're there for a year and it's a stepping stone to something better, but jobs that they graduated uh, a year, two, three, four years, and they're still there today. Um, and the university really likes, likes to see that. 
So that's kind of been our experience. We've been very grassroots, uh, very grassroots even up till now. Um, we don't. Uh, we have toyed with offering four credit type mm -hmm. engagements and classes, um, but we've we've primarily stood clear of that, and we've been able to pipeline students fairly well. I mean, we routinely have 10 to 15 students year after year. That's great. That, so it doesn't sound to me like anybody has any problem attracting students to the program. Is that correct? I, I, I've had problems before. A lot of the problems end up when I think year to year. I, I think it's pretty easy to, to, to create um, some interest, uh, but um, it, it's good to have backups, let's say. Sure. Uh, because because um, you know undergraduates' lives are very dynamic, and and that can affect uh, their commitment to 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 going to the competition. Sure. What with the Instagram and Facebook and all. That's right. They've got a full life. Well, the competition also occurs during finals for many of the students. So ah, some years point. it's been hard for us to 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 get a good team together. Uh, yeah. And it's it's also a sustained six to nine month effort as well, right? Yeah, the commitment is pretty, pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. So let's say you have your team together, you have your institution is bought off on this. How do you go about getting a sponsor? Who should you target? How does that work? So we targeted uh, the vendors that, that provide us with supercomputers. Yeah. Um, so um, so we, had, we had good connections with Cray and SGI because they were providers of of machines for our our uh, facility, and and SGI was the first one to raise their hand and say yes, we want to sponsor the team. Was it pretty smooth working with them? Yeah, it was. They gave us their best uh, system engineer in the Asia Pacific region to help the team, and he was really awesome. So if he's not their best, then that'd be fantastic for them to have. <laughs> Great team of people. Um, so yeah, he helped our team to uh, basically pick out from a list of parts what parts they wanted to put together to make their cluster. Yeah, very good. Uh, how about your other experiences, folks? No, I, I was just going to say that we had a fairly similar experience. We reached out to the vendors that we are familiar with and that we work yeah. and mostly, and they've typically been pretty open to supporting the team, um, usually with you know, loaner systems and, and things like this. Yeah, primarily hardware. But, exactly, like John says, primarily hardware. Getting cash sure. from anybody is actually very hard. <laughs> yeah, 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 but but do you guys think that the competitions have gotten to the point in stature that the hardware vendors get it and they see the benefits of being involved? I, I keep seeing a lot of new hardware vendors who want to get involved, which is really great. I think each year we see some, some, you know, maybe some people that we've seen before in terms of vendors, but also I think we see typically a few new ones that uh, are, are either uh, new to the field or are new to the competition. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so I, 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 I love I, seeing I, that. Yeah, it's, it's great. And I think um, I think those people definitely see the uh, the – uh, the importance of a competition. So if you know somebody like that, I feel like that's a good place to target because they see a, a lot of, um, you know, if, they, if they're they not already spending, you know, half a billion dollars on marketing, that stuff can be really important. But if you talk about some of the, you know, maybe not half a billion dollars, but if you talk about some of the big uh, big people, they, they uh, big companies, they have tremendously large departments to get their name out there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, even even though you can often get commitments uh, within you know specific deals or 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 uh, um, or just just in general from from people that you work with and you know, um, it's often I feel like the small the small vendors that are are um, that are really hungry and see the the true benefit of it. I would have to agree with that. I mean, I'm looking at. Uh, for instance, a company called Silicon Mechanics, which isn't huge by any means. They're a VAR uh, located in Seattle, but they've sponsored a team from Boston for three or four years running sure. and did a great job of it. Also seeing um, along the lines of, of new vendors like some of the liquid cooling vendors like Cool IT has right. been more than happy to help out. 
So if there's any vendors listening, uh, you know, uh, please, uh, we can help you connect with teams. And if any teams are having problems with vendors, we often get vendors to, to, uh, that, that want uh, to sponsor a team but don't have anyone specific in mind. Well, so um, please um, email uh, uh, the committee for the question competition, and, and we can help make those connections. Would you say we're at the point that if someone has a team together, a uh, credible effort, um, that we could find a sponsor for them one way I mean, or another? We, we can make the connections, right? I okay. think they, ha they have to do... Uh, you know, we the, the maybe the things that's not being said is that every single person on this call has had to do some sort of negotiation, or their administration has, uh, in, in order to get their sponsorships and 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 have um, the vendors agree to, to to give them the hardware. So, um, you know, I think that's something that has to be done at the institutional level. It's not something that the committee can really do beyond yes. saying, you know, here's two interested parties. You guys should talk. And let's level set this too, because we're talking about oh, I don't know, a couple hundred grand worth of equipment here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, yeah, on the high end, but I think a hundred grand is probably, uh, you know, par for the course. Well, we're talking six to ten nodes, dual sure. processor nodes, uh, probably some accelerators. Um, usually you've got, uh, Mellanox has been great in supporting people with I.O. Um, sure. and interconnect. But it does add up. Absolutely. But it's it's not out of reach of most hardware vendors. Yeah, I would agree. I was just going to say, usually they just lend it to you, too. So it's not yeah. like they're really giving up $100,000 worth of equipment. They're just letting you borrow it. Yes. They're, yeah, they're not giving it away. That all goes back. Actually, it's interesting. One of the, the company I referred to earlier, Silicon Mechanics, um, would give away a copy of of whatever system they'd given to the students, they would um, sort of not auction it off, but they would have a grant writing competition and give it to the winning grant writer for a nonprofit. Oh, so that was cool. kind of neat, and that's great publicity. So, so you ha let's say you have your hardware uh, sponsor, you've got your team in place. How do you get the financial support, and what do you need for financial support? So for my team, because we were out in the middle of nowhere, literally. That's your own um, fault. You have no one to blame but yourself, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, for me, but the, those kids, anyway, they, they grew up there. Uh, but we, So we budgeted $3,000 um, per student just for flights. And that was about right for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I guess different competitions are different, but the competition at Etsy, they would cover the team's lodging and um, registration. So really, they just needed some spending money maybe for buying souvenirs, and then they needed this huge plane ticket. Sure. And, and so that was tough to get uh, about $18,000. That's a big what number. We had. Yeah, it's a big number. Yeah, there's a lot of zeros. And so, so the first year, um, SGI actually sponsored the team partially and gave us a good chunk of money to pay for half of the team. And then um, in Western Australia, the, the biggest industry is digging up the ground and sending it to China or other countries. So. <laughs> Which I think we would call mining, wouldn't we? <laughs> That's what most people call it, yeah. <laughs> so there were a lot of big mining companies, so we, uh, you know, we solicited from the mining companies. And so that first year we were successful in that. The second year we had a little harder time. You know, the first year it's always easy, it's always exciting, people want to get involved. Second year it's a little harder. Um, we were able to make a connection through one of the applications. So one of the applications was uh, was for like um, shallow water modeling circulation of like you know like uh, for example harbors and bays mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we actually were working with a company who was using our computers to do that type of modeling. Ah. So so we said, hey. Uh, you know, why don't you sponsor our team and give us some money for at least one of our students to go? And um, maybe if you have somebody who knows something about this code, you could help us, help us too. So yeah, as it turned out, it worked out really well. Um, they had somebody who had used that code before, 
um, they don't use it themselves in their, you know, they have their own proprietary product that they use for, for their um, simulations. But they were familiar with it, and so this person actually came and helped my student to learn how to use this code and how to run it and what it means. And then um, my student actually ended up getting an internship at that company after afterwards. Oh. So she, yeah. It all worked so it was, out then. Yeah, it was a fantastic relationship. And they gave us enough money to sponsor one student. Uh, Steve and Doug, what do you guys think about uh, how do you tin cup your way into these competitions as an institution? Well, I think Rebecca hit on part of it. Is a lot of the, there are a lot of, uh, users of HPC out there, companies that use HPC. So I would encourage other people who are interested in, in being a, an advisor to think outside the box a little bit and look at, at the, the companies out there that use this technology. Um, and we've done the same thing, a similar case to Rebecca's, where Lockheed Martin uh, uh, gave us some huge financial support in the past um, and actually hired some of our students uh, because they're an HPC, uh, they're an organization that uses HPC. Mm. Same thing for Intel and uh, uh, Google. Uh, they've provided uh, support in the past, and because they see the value of a potential talent pool there. Sure. How about you, Steve? Um, so, you know, we, we kind of do a little bit of both. I mean... Um, uh, well, actually, we've done it three ways. One is, is the way that Doug was saying for kind of external companies, HPC users, you might consider them. Um, and, and so we, we've had a few companies sponsor us in that way. Um, oftentimes, we can get a little bit of money from the vendors, not typically everything, but, um, you know, uh, we, we definitely ask. And, you, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And then I think the third place is, I mean, we look to our organizations. Uh, you know, my, my organization is um, in central IT, um, so, you know, I, I write uh, pleas to the, the deans of the colleges of the students that, that may be participating and, and, you know, just ask them what, what they have available. Um, Purdue in particular has a few, um, in specific colleges, there's a few programs for, you know, things like undergraduate research or uh, uh, um, uh, experiential learning and things like that, and, and, and we're able to get some of that money uh, as well. So those are the three ways that, that we've been able to do it um, at Purdue. Great. So now we have the teams, we have the money, uh, we've got the institutional support. How do you train them? What's the timeline like? Uh, what goes into doing this? You want to start this out, Rebecca? Yeah, sure. So, um, so in Australia, the, the school year actually goes from, uh, it, it, it follows the, 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 you know, the calendar year. I know it's crazy, but mm. it's because you know the the seasons are off by six months. So you you start in the fall, which is spring in the northern hemisphere. It's kind of it was kind of weird at first. So anyway, so I I was able to simply just uh, meet with the students uh, once a week uh, for an afternoon um, during the entire first and second semesters of school. And in fact. Um, the competition was during their finals week, so they kind of liked that because then they got to uh, put off their finals for a little <laughs> later. Um, and, and it worked out really well. So we didn't have to worry about summer break and what people were doing in their summer internships or whatever because uh, it wasn't summer, it was winter. <laughs> mm. um, and, yeah, and so some of the students got, uh, got like, credit for this. So um, in Australia... Uh, a bachelor's degree is typically three years, and in the fourth year, you spend doing your honors thesis. Okay. And so they were they were able to incorporate it into their honors thesis, or they were able to get credit for it in their computational physics lab, or some of them just did it out of the kindness of their heart because they were just really interested. So, John and Carlos, I know that given what um, the teams from Texas have done, you guys must have, what, a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week immersive training into HPC, <laughs> massages and masseuses all over the place, a lot of sports medicine going on, perhaps some illegally banned substances, who knows. So what's the training yeah, like for the... No. No? <laughs> no. No, we, we typically start uh, having meetings maybe every couple of weeks, give them access to some of the systems here so that they start getting familiar with, with things. Over the summer, 
most of the students have internships that are outside of Austin, so we try to keep in touch by doing biweekly or, if needed, weekly oh, remote no. meetings. Yeah. Um, and that's worked so far. That's worked pretty well. Once we get to the end of the summer, then we start meeting weekly, and towards the end, it's often multiple times a week. Right. Once we receive our actual hardware, then we usually spend like a full day for maybe three weekends in a row just working on the hardware, assembling the hardware, making sure the students can build the hardware, shoot the hardware, set it up themselves. I mean, that's our, our primary rule is you should know how to do all of this yourself. Yeah. You, by the time you get to the competition, you should not have to rely on us, the advisors, to do any of this for you. Mm. And we try to be accommodating because at that time of the year, you know, we are busy, but they're busy too. So we spend lots of weekends and, and nights in, in the machine room with them. Yeah. Sure. And what do you, what's the experience level of the kids as they come in to this? <laughs> That's extremely varied. Um, <laughs> So to give you an idea, we participated for the first time in 2010, and we got the highest HPL number that year. I don't think anyone in the team knew what Linux was. Nobody. No uh, kidding. Six when they started. Uh, there were two that knew what it was, that, but because they had been volunteers in SC the year before, student volunteers, but they had never used it. So you know, it's not. I think it's perfectly possible to bring them up from a very basic level to being able to to do things reasonably well. It just takes longer. And that's something all of you budding advisors ought to really um, take note of. And I think that, that Doug and Steve will say the same thing, is that you don't have to have highly tuned, highly trained HPC uh, undergrads going into this. Right, guys? No. Yeah. No, one thing I would say is that it definitely helps if you have one or two. And what we've done in the past is students that participated in the competition with us, we've asked them to come back and help us train the next generation. Some of your 40-year-old ringers. Part. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not doing, they're not using ringers. But uh, Steve and Doug, you guys have had some, some pretty inexperienced folks on some of your teams at times. Yeah, we've, uh, at CU, we've had uh, all different levels. Uh, like I said, we we actively recruit from anybody who has any interest. Uh, you, you don't have to be an engineering or a, a physics major or anything like that. Um, we've had uh, anthropology majors that have competed on the team who just have a high degree of interest. Um, and we've brought people from, from relatively no uh, knowledge of, of HPC uh, up to a, a position where they're able to, uh, to build a small cluster you know, it takes time and it and it takes patience. But uh, uh, you know, I can I can certainly uh, agree with what the guys from TAC have said. We get all different levels. Uh, it, it does usually help if you have one or two that that have some kind of uh, knowledge, sorts of uh, you know, seeds for students to collect around and learn from. Peer Someone who's they've heard the word Linux before, perhaps. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say the thing that, that I, I uh, think is most important in a student is, is desire and drive, like commitment, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I've seen uh, brilliant students uh, not do anything, and students that start from scratch uh, do things that I was honestly floored about. So I think, it, you know, to, to me, that, that's the number one quality. And then after that, you, of course, you can say, well, yeah, sure, we'd like to understand Linux, and we, you know, we we want you to 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 be able to 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 work quickly and all the, all these things. But um, to me, commitment is is the the differentiator between uh, you know a student that does really well and, and really understands what's happening, and, and, and a student that that maybe just tags along. Gotcha. What sort of resources are out there? I I don't think that any of you have the time to spend all on your own uh, tutoring these kids uh, and they like Steve just pointed out they need to have some drive and be self starters but uh, what kind of resources are out there to help them um, get up to speed I think each institution is going to be a little different I mean I can speak from the Purdue perspective uh, you know we, we provide a class we also have a lot of trainings that we do just um, uh, generally for our HPC Center that can, can be useful for these types of things 
we also have some system administration classes that, although they aren't necessarily HPC centric, uh, you know, they can they can help jumpstart um, you know a student into understanding um, what's going on. Uh, beyond that, though, I think it, it depends a lot on students. I mean. Um, it, I don't know if this is typical across other institutions, but um, uh, you know we often just give them tasks and say, okay, ask us questions, right? And so, um, you know, of course we give them a little more than that. We'll give them some documentation, things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I think the the expectation for us has always been, you know, you not only do you have to be able to uh, um, do this stuff, you kind of have to be able to learn how to do this stuff on the fly. And I think there's many situations in the, the competition, especially with the introduction of the mystery apps in the past few years, that you know it's it's almost not only do you have to teach you know specific apps, but you also have to teach them how to find out about the apps because they're going to have to do it themselves on the floor by themselves. That makes a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, I I think we're doing something very similar here. We we point them to our user training. Uh, in summer, we run a summer supercomputing institute that lasts for a week, and we try to get as many of them as possible to, to follow that course. And then we really expect them that, as a team, they they try to complete certain tasks that we give them as, as we move closer towards the competition and, and help them along the way. But for this competition, if, if they cannot learn how to find out how to solve problems on their own, they're going to be out of the competition pretty quickly because we're not going to be able to help them. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Once, once they're on the floor, they need to be completely independent. So That's one of the, the latest, newest trends in the competition, too, is that uh, they at least have, they're, they're now getting some professional level tools, uh, like from Alinea for performance characterization, that either they didn't know about or didn't use before. And I think that that's going to uh, help bring the level, everybody's level up that much more, make it that much more competitive. Yeah, and I think there's two things that, that we've found really successful at, at Colorado is uh, uh, the fact that in the science disciplines, when you're, when you're given a particular application and we ask the students to go out and investigate this, this science application and find domain experts, uh, as long as you're respectful of their time and you and you think out your questions, um, they're more than happy to to get into a mentorship type relationship with our students, both from the the science domain uh, side and from the, the vendor hardware and software uh, uh, side. When you find somebody that's enthusiastic about what you do, most people are very enthusiastic about sharing their knowledge about it, and that's been a big help for our students. Oh, yeah, and, and I've found that, uh, from what I've heard anecdotally, is that even the, the folks that have created these applications, they're, they're all open source applications, uh, but even the folks that have created these applications are more than happy to field questions from student teams. Yeah, I, and I think in, in, the, in the competition, uh, we even have a, a Google group where the the, the students can ask questions of, of the application experts that we that we are um, providing. So now that we have our our team together, they're motivated. They know the applications. They're learning them. How do they write that proposal to get into the competition? Are there any tips on that? Uh, so um, we, I actually re, uh, uh, with um, with John and a few others, we we rewrote um, the rubric for for the. Uh, the, for the the proposal, so there, there should be some good documentation out there of exactly what we're looking for. And that's for um, SC this year, two, 2016, the, because the application process is open. Yeah, that that's correct. Um, and um, you want to walk it, us through that a little bit, yeah, or is that sure. or is that part of them being self starters? They have to go walk themselves through it. So I think we make some recommendations about um, student what students should write and what the the um, and what and what the uh, the advisor should write because I feel like there's a, a clear difference there. Um, that we we have I think uh, four or five major uh, points. Um, the um, basically we want you to talk and, and tell us why your team is good. Um, you know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, we want to talk about the we want you to talk about the hardware and software architecture and and why you think it's a winner. Um, 
you want to talk about your vendor relationship, what your vendors promise, you know, what, um, uh, you know, are they going to be helping you, like, uh, teach the kids and things like that. Uh, because, we, you know, and, and real quick, let me interject this here, that sure. in talking with the founders of the cluster competition, it's not just getting that cluster up and running that's the goal of it. A lot of this is project management, working in a team, uh, putting together a big project with a long time frame. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in, in, and vendors really benefit. If you can get, you can't always get them to, to do this, but if you can get them to, to work with the students directly, I think both the vendors and the students benefit uh, considerably. Um, so that, that's something that we really want to know. Um, we also want to know how you prepared your students. So do you have a class? Do you just give them tasks? What, what kinds of things are happening uh, in, in their preparation? And we also um, are interested to know, um, you know, uh, like uh, diversity questions. Um, a, a lot of it, you know, kind of under, underserved institutions uh, or, uh, um, you know, uh, people that maybe traditionally don't participate in HPC, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that type of thing. And then we have a, just a general overall care category, which basically can be summed up as, do we think that um, your team's going to compete uh, and, and, and do well in the competition, right? And so there's a lot more explanation than I just went through uh, on, on sure. the, the website, so please check there. Uh, but, but those are the overall categories. Great. I think, it's, I think it's worth noting the schedule. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about doing this as a team advisor, the, the opening for proposals is usually sometime in February. The, the proposals are due usually sometime in April, May. And then you get notified. Uh, sometimes late May, and then you have the summer, and then you enter uh, another follow-up proposal after the selections have been made in May, um, outlining your, your final competition hardware in the fall, and then you compete in November. So, so project management, team communication, team collaboration is huge throughout the entire process because, uh, you know, I would tell prospective advisors, you can't start too soon. Mm. Yeah, I, and I agree. And, and you know, I, I would say that oftentimes new teams are at a disadvantage here uh, because they oftentimes people will hear about the call and and, uh, and, and maybe a month or two months is not um, sufficient time for them to get started up. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this podcast to kind of give people a jump start. I think a lot of people kind of look at this like this is really cool, but man, I have no idea how where you even start with this, and, and I certainly can relate to that. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I think starting as soon as possible is is really the, the best way. You know, I, w once you get into the rhythm of it, um, you know, I, I, Jane, as soon as I'm back from, 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 from winter break, that, that's when I'm starting to, to, to work on this typically uh, when I was an advisor. So you think, though, that if a team were motivated, uh, they would have time now to get Absolutely. in and get in on this? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, if you communicate with the committee about what's going on, right, if, if you say, you know, in your proposal you put, like, we're in talks with our vendor and, and, and uh, you know, we'll send them kind of an addendum or something in this time frame, you know, we can take that type of thing into consideration. Uh, and, and I think that's typically the thing that's hardest. Uh, I don't think it's getting students. I think it's getting, uh, you know, uh, the, the organizational commitment as well as the vendor commitment that, that um, is, is kind of required before um, you, you, you send your proposal. Mm. Um, so t typically with the vendor commitment, what I would do is I would get, I would send them an email, say, hey, do you, are you guys interested in doing this? They would say, of course we're interested, right? They always say yes. Yeah, we're right? interested in everything. Sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah, um, we have wide-ranging interests. So um, then, you know, I'd send a second email and, and kind of say, uh, you know, before this is before I submit my proposal. Um, you know, these are the things that we'll need mm -hmm. um, uh, in order to be able to, to 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 participate. Is this is this you know doable for you guys? And almost certainly, I'll get a phone call because they want to start talking. They want to start negotiating with me. Um, then, then, you know, we come to a conclusion of what they can provide and whatnot. Um, and then that's what I would put into the, 
the vendor relationship. And then um, once you're done with that, uh, once you've submitted and been accepted, then you want to email them and say, hey, you committed to this. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you committed to it, and we're in. Let's go. That's right. Excellent. Well, is there anything you guys can think of that we left out on this? I think we've given uh, uh, prospective advisors and student teams a pretty good roadmap of how to participate. Any closing comments? I would say if you're if you're thinking about about doing this, um, reach out to. I haven't talked to any advisors who have not been willing to provide advice to other prospective advisors. So reach out to people that, that have competed in the past. Uh, reach out to Stephen. Uh, be persistent. Uh, it's, when we first started this at CU, uh, it was totally student-driven, totally grassroots. And we were able to pull it off to a point where now it's sort of self-sustaining. Self so when you get the proposal announcement, it may look daunting. Um, you know, if you if you sit down and make a strategy and and uh, and ping some other people that have been involved, it's totally doable, uh, and I think it's a great experience for your students. That's great. Yeah, I would add that in terms of of team management, uh, what's helped us in the past is tell the team to please select essentially a team captain that, mm -hmm. that is going to handle a little bit of communication so that we have another level of hey, remember that you're still responsible for these. And when it's a comment between peers, that seems to work much better than when it comes directly from an advisor. <laughs> so sure. we've used that in the past to, to, to improve communication in the team. That's a very good idea. I think my most important advice is that it's really fun, and don't lose sight of that. I mean, it's not really about quote unquote winning the competition. Exactly. I mean, we never won it. Maybe that's why I'm saying that because it's not <laughs> because we never won. But it's, <laughs> but it's so much fun and the kids learn so much and they have a great time. And especially if they come from some totally remote place and they get to, you know, free trip to America, you know, that was like sure. a huge huge sell for my students anyway. Well and that's the other <laughs> thing is they have the entire supercomputing show there for them as well. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I don't think they'd ever seen that many people who were interested in the same thing in one place before. Oh, that's neat. That's great. Well, I want to thank all of you for being on the call here. Uh, really appreciate it, and I know that the uh, uh, soon-to-be student cluster competition advisors out there appreciate it, too. Uh, thank you all for, for joining.